written some books. Um, I'm autistic, two autistic kids, autistic partner. Um, I've worked in virtually every setting I think there is in res residential care and schools and all sorts of things. I've worked in criminal justice and employment. So quite a broad uh, personal and professional uh, perspective um, about, about autism. Uh, I've written two books about relationships. Uh, one was with my partner Keith about our relationship and the other one more generally about adult relationships on the autistic spectrum. Um, today we're going to talk about um, all of relationships, so childhood relationships, adult relationships, all sorts of bits and pieces. The first thing uh, I want us to talk about, all autistic people look like this at some point in their lives. <laughs> And that's everybody, or every autistic person wants a friend that looks like that. They're so cool. Um, the first question really, I think, for, for parents, for teachers, for, for well-meaning uh, carers in terms of thinking about social relationships for autistic people is who is it for? What are your goals and your expectations for this person? Is it that you expect your child or person in your care to have a full and typical social network of people that they're ringing up and texting and WhatsApping and hanging out with and doing all of that sort of stuff? Or is it that you just want this person to be able to get their, their own social and emotional goals met safe, safely and within the comfort zone of that person? Because quite often, well-meaning people can feel sorry for an autistic person for not having very many friends, not knowing that that autistic person is feeling sorry for the non-autistic person having to put up with all these idiots in their life. It kind of works both ways, but it's important that this, this lovely empathy that some of you feel is not misplaced, that having lots of social interaction is not necessarily the best thing for the person in your care. Um, and we have to make sure that the, the well-being, the quality of life, the happiness, the social expectations belong to the person that we're dealing with, not your well-meaning feeling that more is better, more, more interaction, more people, whatever is better, because it's not. Um, and that's kind of very much what I want to talk about today. So some of the kind of questions we're going to ask today um, and think about are, imagine if none of this people friendship stuff was intuitive at all and you had to learn about it and study it in the same way that if you got a pet rabbit for the first time and you had to read a book about how to look after your rabbit and not kill it then in some respects there's an element of that for some autistic people. Why do I need a friend? What do I want one for? What are the rules? What do I get one? What is one actually? Is it worth it? All of these questions that probably a lot of people don't ask because it's just obvious. It's, of course I want friends, of course I know how to get them, of course they're valuable. And that sometimes we might need to really break this down for some autistic people to understand and be able to make an informed choice as to whether a friendship or a relationship actually, when you've got all of the information, is this going to um, enlighten my life? Or actually, is it just going to be a massive hassle? Because it's not as obvious as you might think it is, um, as it is for, for the, for the non-autistic population. And by asking some of these questions to autistic people in our lives, you get to know what that person's expectations are. So if you say to somebody, why do you want a friend? They might say, well, I want somebody who's got I don't know, more My Little Ponies than I have, or I want someone who will let me win at stuff. So it, you, you might discover that this person's expectation of what they're going to get from a friendship is entirely unrealistic, and then that gives us something to work with. Okay, well, we need to kind of work on that, that that's not quite how it might be, or it might not kind of work that way. So I've got some sort of suggestions about how we actually support the real nuts and bolts of relationship development and assume nothing. doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how clever you are, what your intellectual level is. Sometimes some autistic people just massively struggle with the kind of obviousness that, that a lot of people find um, uh, around, around relationship. The message that a lot of people get, or most of us get, as we grow up is that people are a good thing. 
and, and that's the message we get. Being with people is a good thing, it's healthy, it's good for us, it's a nice thing, and the more people you can get, the better it is. It makes you look like you're socially acceptable, it makes you look like you're popular, it clearly means I'm a good person if I'm surrounded by lots of people. That's the kind of typical general view. It's on the social media, it's on the TV, everywhere you look, everybody's running around in bars, drinking Baileys, and having a whale of a time with very attractive, beautiful people. Um, we know that the reality of that is, is not, not that simple. Um, and certainly, if you're autistic, it's not that simple, that more is necessarily a, a better thing. Before we kind of move on um, into sort of friendships and stuff, um, this is something I kind of mentioned this morning. Um, there's a little bit of very initial research and a lot of anecdotal evidence that suggests that in terms of personal relationships, um, a higher number than in the general population of autistic people do not consider themselves to be heterosexual. Their attraction or not attraction to other people is much more kind of broad and diverse than that. And there is no one route into that. So, for example, there's considered to be quite considerably higher numbers of transgender people or people with gender identity um, issues in the autistic population. Something like seven times more autistic people in gender identity clinics than there are in the, in the general population in identity, uh, gender identity clinics. The important thing about all of this is that there's not one route into it. So some people will definitively feel and believe, and maybe correctly so, that they have been born into the wrong gendered body. Some people are choosing that, well, if I don't feel that I get on with people of my own gender, maybe that means, in a rather black and white logical way, that I belong in a, in a different gender. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. It might be that your experiences have been negative. It might be that you're attracted to certain sorts of people, and therefore that leads you to believe a, a certain thing. What we do know is that it's not necessarily going to be a binary situation for autistic people. And as you're getting into puberty and into that age where you're starting to question your, your sexuality, your gender identity, you're already autistic. You're already struggling with all of whatever autism is bringing for you. And you may also potentially have this feeling of, actually, I don't even know who I am. I don't know who I like, who I'm attracted to. I don't know if I'm male, female, neutral, pansexual, whatever. I think we just have to be very cautious that this is likely to be a person with a lot going on if this is something going on for, for that person um, and, and for a lot of people it's not binary. The black and white nature of autism often means that you would like it to be binary. You would like someone very definitively to tell you whether you are male, female, straight, gay, asexual, bisexual, whatever. And it may well be that actually this person just has to make up their own box, that there is no black and white, that, that there isn't going to be any absolute right fit, and that what we need to accept is that this person may be much more fluid in the way that they dress, in the way they present themselves, if, if they're a, a male wearing makeup or a, a female wearing very masculine clothing or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I think it's important that we understand that there is a, a much broader spa span of identity in autistic people. Some of that may be social. If you've just had less influence from your peers, Maybe you're just more open to different experiences and different ideas. Um, maybe if you don't connect with very many people and then you really, really love lampposts and then you find somebody who also really, really loves lampposts, that you decide to spend the rest of your life with that person, whether that person is male, female, trans or whatever. Who cares? They love lampposts. It may well be that for an autistic person, that connection is far, far more important than any kind of social construct of gender or sexuality or anything. Lampposts are everything, so you know, why wouldn't we want to spend the rest of our lives together? We've got to open our minds a little bit to how other people perceive some ideas of, of sexuality and attraction and, and all of those kind of things. Again, with gender identity, um, a lot of people just feeling, I'm just me, certainly. I ask questions about this uh, in, in my book about do you feel male, do you feel female, and, and a lot of people, myself included, my partner included, um, we don't really feel anything in terms of a social contract. We know that we're biologically male or female, but we don't really buy into a sort of social view of what that means in terms of how we behave, in terms of what we do. If anything, uh, certainly my partner Keith and I, we're, we're kind of round the wrong way. I'm the much more physical person who likes getting 
grubby and, and making a big old mess of things. Whereas Keith's quite precise. He takes a long time to do things. He's very gentle. He's very careful not to kind of damage things. Whereas I'll just go and wallop it with a hammer. If you come and look in our bathroom, you will see that Keith has about seven or eight different products that he uses. They're often very sensory things. He likes talcum powder. He likes things that smell really nice. So he's got all of this kind of stuff. I've got one, and that's his deodorant. That's it. No products whatsoever. So in some sense, we just don't buy into this stuff. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, we don't notice it, um, but it, it's kind of interesting from a, from a traditional kind of, kind of perspective. So what we can't see is this possible kind of sense of just, I don't see this. This, this gender doesn't really exist, perhaps, f for a person. Uh, and we know that there's uh, some research that suggests that there are slightly at at atypical gender presentations. A lot of people, when I, did, when I wrote my book, um, a lot of people were about... At least a third of people were not identifying as heterosexual um, or as female or, or male in their... In their in their identity, they describe themselves as pansexual, gender fluid, gender neutral, asexual, those kind of things. Um, so certainly people kind of experimenting and exploring different, different kind of ways of being. Certainly potentially um, autistic people and autistic children not really buying into the kind of social gender interests. So um, little boys having pink fluffy hats and teddies and toys and squishy things that, that we, we may associate more with girls. And then we have autistic girls who love their cars and their science uh, and, their, and their models and, and, and building blocks and things. So sometimes from a very early age, it, it's, a, it's a child that's willing to, 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 to go anywhere. They're not excluded certain toys and certain interests because of social gender whereas sometimes other children do because they know that it's not quite socially acceptable sometimes the autistic kids they don't care they'll just wear or, or play with what, whatever it is that they that they want to um, and we don't know why that is whether you're just born that way because your hormone profile is different maybe you're just less aware of all of those societal pressures maybe you're a more independent individual because of that and you can just throw all of this stuff out and just just be yourself and, and enjoy yourself in that kind of way we don't really know so I've put the male and female in inverted commas. If you could do me a favour and not photograph this and tweet it, because I'll just get lynched if anybody knows anything about Twitter. <laughs> I've put male and female in inverted commas. Male being this much more kind of traditional kind of profile of what we thought autism looked like, which was kind of nerdy loner boys, um, Sheldons and Rainmans and people like that. This female profile is what we are more understanding to be around about girls. But they're not gender specific, um, and, and it's wrong to say that they're definitively male or female. But there seem to be some different ways in which autistic people present their social selves, um, rather than just this one blanket way that, that, we, uh, that, we, that we used to kind of think. What we do know is that it's often the case that whatever gender you are, you're often more comfortable with someone from a different gender. That often your own peer group, your own age group, and your own gender group don't really suit you because you're different and it's easy you know if you have a box of eggs and one of them is much much bigger than the other it sticks out like a sore thumb if you have a box of apples and one egg then it's kind of different it's more difficult to judge the egg because all of the rest are apples because they're a completely different thing altogether and that very much seems to be the case often with, with autistic children, is that if, if a boy is with a group of girls, it's harder to judge him in the same way that you might judge him if he was in a group of boys and just not interacting in the same way. Uh, and often it seems that the autistic children, they kind of intuitively know, you're not really my people, I'm, I'm finding life a little bit easier over here. And the boys seem to find the girls easier because the girls can be a bit kinder. They're a little bit more gentle. They might scoop him up and look after him uh, and, and don't put him under that kind of obvious sort of male peer pressure that, that you might have. And again, for the females, boys are easier because the females are very nuanced. Um, their, their social abilities, their fickleness, they're changing their mind, the, the, the social stuff related around uh, whether I like you or not, whether you're cool or not. Um, boys are simpler. So often we find that individuals kind of swap over with their, with their peer groups and feel more comfortable uh, within, within a different peer group. 
for the kind of traditional male in inverted commas profile, um, we, we've perceived that these kids are loners. They don't want to be around other people. They're much happier by themselves because it's so difficult to comprehend how on earth you make a friend, how on earth you be with someone. It's just complicated. Sometimes this awkwardness comes across as a bit of arrogance, a bit of superiority in this child, knowing that they're right about things, always wanting the rules to go their way. And if the rules don't go their way, they'd rather just be alone and withdraw. They don't try to compromise, they just give up uh, and just move off and do that kind of thing by themselves. My way or no way. Can't access social occasions or agendas and just say no to stuff because you can't imagine that it would be pleasant. It's probably going to be difficult. It's just much easier not to bother to go. So what we end up with is often someone with not very many friends or no friends at all or very similar friends, um, not choosing to step outside their comfort zone very much, preferring to just play alone and do your own stuff because it's just less stressful to do so. On the other hand, which is this kind of slightly newer, more recent understanding of how some people might be perceiving uh, autism uh, and, and approaching being autistic, and these are the people that have been missed, often the females and also, also some males in here as well. They're social observers, they're little psychologists, they're watching other people, they're learning the rules because they know they don't fit in, often from a very young age, but they want to. So they're going to find out how to fit in in a rather systematic and mechanical way because the intuitive abilities are not necessarily there. So they will copy, they will mimic, they will do everything. They will write notes in a book of the experiments that they've tried to fit in and how it worked and whether it didn't work and what they could try next. It is a proper mission, scientific experiment of how to be social. A huge amount of mental effort for some of these kids in trying to work out how on earth am I supposed to do all of this stuff. And because it's so highly priced for them, when it goes wrong, it's devastating. So we have huge mental health knockbacks because you didn't get invited to a party. You, you, you didn't get invited out. Somebody chose to play with somebody else rather than you. It may well have been that those things were just in the general nature of things, that maybe lots of kids didn't get invited to the party. But you're not going to think about it like that. All you're going to think of is that you failed and that you should have been invited. So your own kind of way of thinking, this kind of black and whiteness, this difficulty with perspective, means that you see everything that goes wrong and you take it to heart very, very personally. But it's exhausting, this effort you make. You put this social performance in, you're there, you're smiling, you're doing the right thing, you're learning all the things that you've, you've mimicked and you're putting them all out there. And at the end of the day, you're absolutely broken and exhausted by all of this. And this is very much the case for, for some of these kids. They look very invisible in terms of their autism. They don't look very autistic at all. They're chatty and they're smiley and they're charming all day at school. And then they come home and absolutely hit the floor and are just done for uh, at, at the end of the day. And so we see a lot more mental health issues in that profile than we do in the other one. Because the other one's just saying, no, I can't go there, no. Which is very protective for some people. You're not going to get stressed, you're not going to get anxious because you're just not willing to put yourself in a position where you're, where you're that uncomfortable. Whereas the other part of autism is desperately trying, 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 saying yes to things and then cancelling at the last minute. Um, saying yes to everything. Yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that. I'd love to do that. That would be great. And then as the event approaches, it almost kind of comes into focus and you start to think, oh, well, I'm going to have to get a bus and how will I get home and who will be there and what will I eat and oh, that's going to be much more difficult than I thought and I'm going to be so exhausted and you know what, actually I can't go. So you end up looking unreliable and autistic people aren't really unreliable people. We're pretty solid, pretty solid people but this inability to kind of imagine what this event will be like causes you to be unreliable at, at, at the last minute. Um, because it suddenly becomes real. It's too far away at the beginning. It looks exciting and wonderful. Uh, it's too, too far away, and then it comes closer, and oh no, the detail comes in, and that, that can't happen. That's very much me. I get very excited by things. I get, to, I get invited to some really nice places around the world to come and do talks, um, and I always say yes to them immediately. I've been invited to Bhutan, which is out in Tibet. I get invited to America. I've been there a few times. 
uh, Moscow, Spain, all sorts of places. And I always go, yeah, yeah, it's exciting. I love that, exciting. And then you suddenly go, oh, how long's the flight? And oh, I'm going to have a panic attack. And oh, well, I don't know where I'm going to be. And oh, that's good. Oh, and the weather's going to be terrible. So rather than thinking of that bigger picture stuff at the beginning, it's only later on that that starts to kind of happen. Um, and, and sometimes I've ended up with plenty of notice having to say, I'm sorry, I can't come. Because I've realised that flying to Bhutan is one of the third most frightening aeroplane landings in the world. And I have a panic attack on a train. So I, th I think that wasn't for me, really. Once you've seen the YouTube videos, if anyone wants to look at it, Bhutan Airport. 5,000 metres up in the Himalayas, and the, I think the pilot has to do a really tight left turn to stop hitting a Himalaya just before they land in a plane that's about that big. It seemed nice at, at the beginning, but I didn't go. <laughs> so these quite different social profiles, one of them desperately, desperately wanting friends, and one of them maybe wanting friends, but actually just having absolutely no idea how to, how to get there. So it looks different, um, and, and we have to take all of that kind of stuff into account. What is the same in both of these people is a fundamental difficulty, which is in the diagnosis, of understanding what the hell people want. Understanding what people mean, understanding what they're talking about, whether they've got hidden agendas, whether they're making a joke, whether they fancy you, whether they don't, whether they hate you. There's a whole bunch of stuff there that is common to both of these people, but is dealt with in a different way. One is, okay, I don't understand it, I'm going to learn all about it and then I will. The other one is, oh no, I don't understand it, I'll just go over here by myself, it's too complicated. So choosing different ways to address it, but the core issue is this is just over and above my, my expectation or even my desire. So what we're talking about is somebody fitting in to a social world that is largely determined by people who are not autistic. Um, I absolutely not for a second saying that all autistic people should be not autistic or, or fit into that world, but if you want to, there are certain rules and expectations that are there. Whether you like it or not, they are there. And some of these expectations are non-verbal stuff. You need to know that somebody's interested in you. You need to know that they want to talk to you or that they're bored stiff or that they hate the sight of you. It's important that you recognise those basic, basic early signals. You are expected in any kind of friendship or relationship to share something. I'm sure some of you can already start to see some problems here for the autistic person in this relationship business. You share your stuff, you share your plans, you share your life, you share your space, you share your home. You share all sorts of things, and, and I think we know that a lot of autistic people really struggle with the concept of sharing. The concept of sharing seems to be that I get less if I give you some of my stuff, and that doesn't seem very logical or rational if I could just keep it all to myself. Thank you very much. So that's hard. You, in order to have a friend or a partner, you are going to have to share something or not several different things. So that's stressful, that's difficult, for, for lots of reasons. Maybe sensory reasons, maybe social reasons, maybe just capacity reasons. You're likely to have to offer some form of what we might call companionship interest in another person, spending time with another person, learning about them, something more than just a functional, business-like relationship. You're going to have to put some emotional capital into this in order to invest in this person and for them to feel valued to want to spend their time with you. You're going to have to be flexible because people, unfortunately, change their minds. They say they want to do something and then they get ill or they just change their mind or they don't want to do it anymore. And one day you go to McDonald's with them for six years and they always have exactly the same burger and then one day they have a different burger. And what's all that about? You've got to cope with that. This is somebody just being a normal individual and just changing their plans uh, all, all, all the time. Uh, my, my partner Keith and I, we met on a very high class website called Hot or Not. Is anyone familiar with Hot or Not? Very early days of internet dating, none of this matching profile, harmony, psychometric testing nonsense, not on Hot or Not. On Hot or Not you had about 100 words to describe yourself um, and some keywords. And then if you matched on some keywords, then that was it, that was it. It was very, very, very simple. And the three keywords that Keith and I matched on were chocolate, the Simpsons and Chicken Korma. And we've been together for 15 years now. <laughs> and recently, Keith said he no longer likes Chicken Korma. So I'm not really sure what's going to happen now. 
Because if you don't know someone anymore, it's, it's hard to cope with these sorts of things. Why don't you like chicken korma anymore? Because uh, you only knew that chicken korma existed at the time. Yeah, yes. You, you have other curries in your life now, don't you? <laughs> You're a philanderer in the curry department. <laughs> you also might have to have some kind of physical contact in your life, in, in your relationship, if in your friendship. It might be holding hands, it might be hugging, it might be kissing, it might just be playing. It might be you know, sitting in the paddling pool together or mussing around in dirt or something. Potentially, again, that may be an issue for some people. There may well be some kind of emotional support, some kind of intuition, some kind of empathic response to, to know what your friend or your partner wants, to mind read them, to, to intuitively understand that that person is feeling sad today or wants something for you, but from you without that person uh, actively asking for that. You're likely to have to compromise. You're likely to have to do things that you don't want to do. All of this is highly problematic for an autistic person, and you can imagine why sometimes it's easier just to be by yourself, because all of this is just really, really hard going uh, for, for some autistic people. You're going to have to maintain this relationship. You're likely to contact people for purely social reasons. I was saying this morning that with my friends, luckily, who are pretty much all autistic, uh, we don't do that. We don't just go, hello, how are you? We don't send photos graphs of stuff we don't, we just don't do it um, and time and time again when I uh, work with autistic people and, and often people say oh I wish I had more friends and I say well do you do you ever ever contact anybody do you ever say hello do you ever initiate any kind of interaction and they go oh no I can't be bothered with that and so there seems sometimes to be a real misunderstanding that if you want more friends you have to look after them they are like little little babies in a nest or, or a, t a car with a tank of petrol. You have to keep topping it up. You can't just have it, leave it there. It will rust and die. You have to do something about it. And it seems that that's quite a fundamental difficulty to remember, to be on the radar, to have the energy to continually contact people, just to kind of keep in there, just to say, hi, I care about you, I'm interested in you, that sort of thing. Um, and it's very, very common with the, with the people I meet that just go, oh, gosh, I couldn't manage that. You can't have both, mostly. Unless you've got a really cool gang of autistic friends, most people require some kind of little bit of a top-up along the way. Understanding the two-way nature of relationships, it's not all self-centric. It's about another person, their needs, their wants. They have to want to be with you as much as you want to be with them. And therefore, you've got to work out why you what you can offer them and why they should stick around you've got to know that stuff it's not just enough to say well I like you therefore we're friends uh -uh, that person has a choice too and I think sometimes some autistic people struggle to make that leap to go oh okay so what does that person want or need from this friendship from this relationship I have to pay attention to that or that person will leave of course they will, because they're not going to be getting their needs met, whatever their needs are. So it's real nuts and bolts kind of stuff uh, for this person to understand. So essentially, everything that's up there, it's autism. And yet those are things that an autistic person is expected to do if they want a neurotypical, non-autistic type relationship. Um, none of those things are likely to be natural, intuitive, and uh, ever uh, infinitely available. There's likely to be some kind of capacity issues. Uh, so autism, what does that look like in terms of what this person might require? All autistic men do look like that at some point in their lives. I've been out with both of those men. I haven't. But I've got one that looks very much like them. <laughs> Even down to the check shirt. <laughs> so purposeful communication. Um, for, for some autistic people, the point of communicating with somebody is knowledge gathering, is information gathering, is needs meeting. The idea of just talking for the hell of it. For some people, what on earth would you be doing that for? You are just filling up my memory bank with crap, with spam. It's, it's exhausting, it's pointless, there's no need for me to know this stuff whatsoever. So, as we saw, that's kind of tricky if somebody's wanting to share their life with you and you're needing to build up some kind of knowledge about that person and, and show interest and, and care for them. 
a much more pragmatic problem-solving approach to emotional problems. And again, we spoke this morning about this idea of empathy, that if somebody comes to you with a problem, often an autistic person might struggle with the idea of giving you a hub and going, oh, there, there, isn't that dreadful? Although they may well have learned how to do that. While they're giving you a hug, in the back of the, uh, what you're not seeing is that their eyes are rolling and they're going, oh, God, here we go again. And actually what that person would like to do is to stop you being sad because they are kind and compassionate and want that to happen, but in a much more practical problem-solving way. So this is somebody who's much likely to tell you how to fix your emotional problem, leave your job, leave your partner, kill your children, whatever. Um, that is the solution, uh, you know, rather than just offering emotional support and being with you in your situation. Typically, that isn't something that autistic people find terribly easy to do, um, unless you're an autistic person yourself, and that person can hugely empathize with whatever it is that, that's, that's going on for you. But in a non-autistic world, this, this pragmatism is not always appreciated. It's considered insensitive, it's considered harsh, it's considered cold, when actually there's a really strong desire to actually make you feel better but being delivered in a slightly more kind of pragmatic, practical uh, kind of way, not necessarily appreciated in the same way. A lack of understanding potentially for some autistic people for the neurotypical non-autistic social rules. Taking people at face value, not necessarily reading between the lines, not reading hidden agendas, not knowing that you might say that you're fine when the last thing that you are is fine. Uh, an autistic person is likely to just go, and said they were fine, off I go. Uh, and then wonder why the person's crying two minutes later when you've kind of wandered off somewhere. Um, not really understanding when people aren't literal, aren't clear, aren't obvious about their needs and their goals and their requirements. Um, it's just way too complicated for, for some people to cope with. Uh, preference for your own way. So this whole compromise thing, again, compromise seems to be doing something that somebody else wants. But your way is always better if you're autistic. You're usually right because you've done the logic, you've done the research, you've worked it all out, and actually it is correct your way. But this whole compromise thing means you have to kind of water down your own brilliance and take on the opinions of other people who just haven't done the research to the great degree that you have. Um, so compromise is not a preferable thing whatsoever. Very difficult thing for a lot of people to do. Um, and very much so, it is the case that most autistic people think they are right all of the time. Um, and they probably are, because we've done the research. Um, sensory sensitivity, again, being around people means being around people. That might be touching people, people touching you. It might be a crowd. It might be a shopping center, a cinema, a restaurant. That's difficult. It might be something more intimate in terms of touching, kissing, those sorts of things. Again, for some people, that's really either wonderful and lovely, sometimes inappropriately so. So some people are touching when they perhaps shouldn't be touching. Uh, but for other people, the idea of being close to somebody is, is incredibly uncomfortable and not something that they would, they would be able to cope with. Uh, recognizing and responding to people's needs again not really knowing why dear what people want because there's not much clarity there um, and actually needing time by yourself so not necessarily wanting to be by yourself all the time I think that most autistic people really do want friends and relationships but with selected people for selected periods of time doing selected activities. It's not a kind of blanket, hey, give me tons of friends, let's all hang out for the rest of the weekend. It's, well, would you like to come around for an hour and a half next Tuesday where we can play Minecraft and then you will leave? That's what it looks like. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be brilliant. It's going to be brilliant. Do I want to do any more? No, thank you. Too exhausting to kind of do any more. And I think that's a difference. It's, it's not about none. It's not black and white. It's not none and all. It's something much more kind of specific that we need to be helping people uh, to, to kind of get up uh, and, and do. Oh, I've clicked without needing to. The other thing I think that, that often you see for autistic people is a tendency to kind of want intensity and deepness in conversation. So not really want the chit-chat stuff, but actually really, really want to talk about some good stuff, some, some topics, some subjects, some debating kind of things. And if you've just met somebody, and rather than just going, oh, hello, where do you come from and what do you do, you've suddenly gone, so what do you think about Trump? And you've deep, some, you know, or what do you think about immigration? Or something really kind of like, whoa, actually, that's quite big and it's quite controversial and all of this kind of stuff. That sometimes autistic people just kind of, they don't realize that it's like a little swimming pool and you have to start in the shallow end. And you have to start with the shallow stuff and the gentle stuff. And then that gives you, uh, in fact, somebody said to me, 
He said, small talk is like applying for a license to be able to speak about bigger things later on. So you, 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 do, your, you do your apprenticeship doing the small talk in the relationship by doing the hello, who are you, all of that kind of stuff. And then you kind of buy into that person and they buy into you. And later on, then you can have the big deep stuff. But often autistic people just jump straight in and people just go, I don't know you this is way too heavy, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give you all of that much more personal stuff. So there's definitely something about a kind of slower way of, of thinking about things. <coughs> it also, and I, I think I said most autistic people do want friendships, do want relationships, but I can't help feeling, and I might be completely wrong, I'm certainly wrong for, for some people, that ultimately for non-autistic people, being in a relationship is perhaps a kind of default it's what most people aim for and hope for and maybe it's easier because you're sharing your lives and the chores and all of those kind of things i think for autistic people the default is actually to be on your own and that that's kind of easier although it's lovely to be around other people and of course they help and share with you but you've got to overcome all of this stuff so being with somebody is a lot, lot more effort than it is to be by yourself. So I think there's a kind of slight difference in the, in the perhaps the, the kind of default p position. I think the other issue that we have, particularly with some kids, and I'm going to say this about my own grandson, so you can't say I'm mean. Well, you can if you like, but I... Some autistic children are not easy to like. Some non-autistic children are not easy to like as well, so let me put that in there. But if it's a child that's kind of not, not compromising, not saying hello, not showing any interest, you know that sometimes this child is difficult for other children to warm to because they're just not putting in and playing that, that kind of game. Uh, my, my grandson um, is he's a twin. Um, he's not been diagnosed with anything, but given the heritage he comes from, it's only a matter of time, really. <laughs> Um, he's very uncompromising, he's very serious, he's very much got this frown. Everything has to be kind of picked apart and, and rationalised. And if you disagree with him, his response is, it's because I'm Zach and that's the end of it. That's kind of hard for a kid to get on with. Um, and I think we have to kind of... I'm not, I don't know what we do about this. Luckily, uh, Zach has got a friend who's probably fairly similar and they just sit next to each other in the playground and they play in a very parallel kind of way and that works really well. We can't tell Zach not to be Zach. That, that's not fair. But equally, we have to kind of appreciate that he's not going to be everybody's cup of tea with that rather kind of uncompromising approach. He, he's just not going to do it any way other than his own. And that's hard for him. That makes him sad. He knows that. But he doesn't know what to do about it without... Kind of compromising himself I suppose and you know maybe as he gets older he'll he'll kind of work out how to how to be so in terms of kind of autistic preferences particularly around children might be lone play certainly parallel play um, is absolutely wonderful even as an adult I think we often people say oh my kid they wanted this friend round and the friend came round and the kid and the friend they didn't speak to each other for three hours and then when I said the kid had to go home they both burst into tears they didn't even know each other was there. They didn't say a word to each other. There's something about silent companionship that, that is so lovely. Not to be alone, but not to have all of these demands of chatter, of compromise, of all of those kind of things. You do your colouring, I'll do my colouring. We'll just be together, but in this kind of silence. There is something really nice about it for some kids. And it's it's not less valuable than if they were physically interacting or, or communicatively interacting. I think the ultimate in parallel play that Keith and I do is cycling. Cycling is just a means of taking turns, of cycling behind each other, staring at each other's bottom for several hours a day. And we've been on three-week sort of long-distance cycling holidays. We're always together, but we don't speak all day because we're riding our bikes and you can't talk to each other while you're, while you're riding your bike. But it's togetherness but it doesn't need words. Uh, and I think if you are not an autistic person and you don't get that, um, it's just worth kind of bearing in mind that for some people, it's enough. It's more than enough just to have a person, somebody with you. So for some kids, liking, they just want a, a parent to be there. They don't want to play with you. They just want you present in the room. That seems to be quite a common thing. So it's, I don't want to be alone, but I can't quite cope with all the demands of, of perhaps sort of typical, typical kind of, kind of interaction. 
Um, organising things, um, helping, sorting things out is quite common. Obviously, we know about lining up and, and those kind of stuff. Um, these are fun things to do, making things straight and organised and planning them, which allows people to be helpful at schools, in break times, um, that, those kind of things. Um, interest groups seem to be really, really core in terms of how autistic people make friends um, with people who like the same things as you. Um, those are very important um, things. They're more important than personality for a lot of people because the idea of making friends based on personality, I've certainly met some autistic people that just find that a really bonkers and weird idea that you would be friends with people who liked different things than you do. Really doesn't make any sense for some autistic people at all. Whereas I'm guessing that some of you here have friends that have completely different interests than you do, that you like them because of, I don't know, your values, your sense of humour, something or other. Um, but for autistic people, often it's a lot more kind of, kind of pragmatic. What, if you're thinking about introducing people into, into groups and clubs and activities in order to enhance um, interaction, you've really got to think about the activity because generally there's some kind of social component. Um, and I found this as an adult. Uh, a few years ago, I took up kickboxing um, because that's what you do when you're a 40-odd-year-old grandma. Um, and what I discovered because a small child told me, um, is that there's quite a large social component in kickboxing. There are quite a lot of autistic kids do martial arts and it really suits them because it's very structured, it's very rule-based. The group that I went to, every single class, you had to find a partner. You had to continually, every exercise we did, you had to go and find a partner. Um, and despite appearances and me talking to large groups of people, I am entirely incapable of standing in a room full of people and finding a partner. I just lurk by the side, hoping that somebody will come and find me, uh, which they didn't. And so invariably, I ended up with a six-year-old. Um, and you can't really practice kind of serious stuff with, you know, with for gusto on a six-year-old. Even I know that. It was, that was uh, okay. So I was lurking at one side in this horrible... I loved kickboxing. I listen well, I observe well, I learn really quickly. I was good at kickboxing. I, 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 I really listen better than most people do. And this child came up to me and he said, Mom, because everybody's very... Uh, respectful in kickboxing. He said, you can't just stand there at the edge waiting for someone to come and be your partner. You've got to go out there and find your own partner. And when you've been taught social skills by a nine-year-old, it's time to leave. <laughs> and that's genuinely what happened. And I never, I never went back because I just thought, this is just no good whatsoever. So time and time again, the activity is what I want to do. I've been to French classes, I've been to other activities. There's always a social component and I can't do it. It makes me exhausted, I'm not interested in it, it doesn't help me at all. I just want to go and do the centre, the thing in the centre. So we have to be kind of cautious when we start putting people into clubs, thinking about what that social component is. Is it a good one or is it something that's actually going to make the interest completely unmanageable because it's too, it's too much, it's too social, there's too many kind of expectations. Uh, so time and time again that becomes very, very kind of difficult. Uh, parties are often not fun, just all kinds of hell and all sorts of new rules about who's allowed to win the games and who's allowed to eat the food and what the food is and all of those kinds of things. Um, People change sensory, that's autism. All parties contain all of those three things in bucket loads. Loads of people, loads of noise, loads of weird stuff going on within the context of a, of a party kind of environment. Um, it's, not, it's not good, it's not fun. If your child doesn't want them, then probably don't let them or don't give them to them. My son's never had a birthday party in his life. My son's autistic. Uh, my daughter was also autistic. She used to love them, so we used to have 15 squealing girls running around the house. Um, which was awful and hell for me, but she, she had a lovely time and I felt like a good mother for a while. Um, getting class buy-in for the autistic child. If you know this kid is good at something, if they're good at remembering stuff, if they're good at facts, if they're good at writing, if they're good at sums, let's put them in places where they can get some kind of social status uh, from the other children over and above their social abilities to, to get some kind of buy-in. We like this kid because he knows stuff. We like this kid because he's a Harry Potter expert. Um, as, as teaching staff, as parents, we can try and kind of build up that buy-in from other kids uh, around those particular kind of skills. 
Um, and we know uh, that break time is often the worst part of the day. For most kids, break time is respite. So you go into the classroom and you get really tired and get really fed up and then you go out into the playground and you let loose and you run around and you see all your friends and you come down and then off you go. For a lot of the autistic kids, you're at that high and then you go into break time and you go higher because there is no respite. It's loud, it's unstructured, there's people around you all of the time. It is not a good place. Typically, when I've met children... Um, who, who really struggle with this, you can say, where do you hide? And they will tell you where the understairs hole is, where the cupboard is, where the shed around the back of the school is. They have found the hidey holes in buildings um, and they go and sit themselves in them into quiet places. So it might be nicer if some, for some of these children. If you know they're really struggling, break time does not increase your social interaction capability. It just wipes you out for learning anything for the rest of the day. Not all of them, but if, if that's, you know that that's what's happening, let's just try and find a space for that kid to go and have a little bit of respite. Um, it's just not helping to, to be by yourself and, and uh, you know, struggling all of the time. So perfect friendships and relationships tend to be similar people. There's some research that says that autistic people tend to have autistic partners, 10 times more likely to have an autistic partner than to have a neurotypical partner eight times more likely to have an ADHD partner than a neurotypical partner. So the little odd bods and the big odd bods, we all find each other somewhere along the way. Uh, so we should be building that. We should be trying not to keep these kids apart, but actually they help each other because they provide a social environment where they all operate in a similar linguistic way, in a similar social way. Their emotional expectations are similar. No one is failing. People are kind together because they're all just having to go, well, what did you mean by that? I didn't know what you meant by that. Okay, well, I'll explain it to you. It's explicit. It's clear. It's not complicated and nuanced in any kind of way. Way. Typically, one-to-one -one interaction seems to work much, much better. Every single extra person in the room is another person who's got to be heard, read, processed, made sense of. It's exhausting. Multiple conversations, multiple stuff going on, absolutely exhausting. So one-to-one -one stuff seems to be very, very much preferred. Define time limits and frequency and not constant interaction. So very much, as I said, a couple of hours, doing something good, planned in advance, goes to plan, let's just knock it on the head after that. Not whole days, not whole weekends. On the whole, that's just too much interaction for, for a lot of autistic people. And so I think the problem is, is that if we try to get people to do a kind of typical social life and they completely freak out and are exhausted and can't cope with it, our solution is, oh, well, we won't do it at all, when actually somewhere in the middle would have been really good. Just because someone can't do six hours doesn't mean they can't do one. So rather than just flinging back and going, all right, fine, we'll never go out again, actually, there is a middle ground. Let's just keep trying. Well, maybe this, maybe this. What do you like? Cinema's great. You're with people, but you're not speaking. Food is great. Swimming is great if you can cope with the noise and the, the sensory kind of stuff. A lot of people have quite a large um, online networks, non-face-to-face -face people, often around gaming, often around sharing interests of, of some description. People also like people who are quite useful if you've got better toys or you know about things. Um, one woman in my book uh, married her husband because he had a really good home gym. And she said that that was why she married him, because she wanted to use his home gym. We are not here to judge what love looks like, ladies and gentlemen, if that's good enough for her. And they're still together, as far as I know, 20-odd years later. So, you know, maybe everybody else is getting it wrong by the way they're choosing their, their partners. Uh, physical needs, we're going to talk about those in a little while. Whatever they are, it's about having some kind of capacity. If I want intimacy, that's good. If I don't, then that's fine as well. It, it's just people, you know, matching up with, with the kind of things that, that, are, that are similar. Um, and either being someone very similar or someone very socially protective that can do the stuff you can't. So it seems that often autistic people are either with other autistic people or people who are hugely, hugely social uh, and, and very much able to kind of navigate social situations, to, to pull that person along, to instigate conversations and, and, and build those relationships where that other person can't. Uh, that very much uh, seems to be the two, the two kind of processes. 
I know uh, Keith and I have, um, we, we've, as uh, David said earlier this morning, we've recently moved to a new town. Um, and Keith doesn't have any requirement for social interaction whatsoever. I'm enough, absolutely more than enough for, for him. Uh, whereas I quite like the idea of a bit of, bit of community, a bit of company. Uh, so we, we recently started volunteering in the local community garden because we really like gardening and we like hoofing stuff about and we like physical labour and all that kind of thing. Um, and what we've come to realise is that, that we... We thought that a community garden was, the emphasis was more on the garden than on the community. Um, and what seems to be the case is that not much gardening happens. People just sort of fanny around filling bird feeders and doing a bit of weeding. And then they have tea and cake and chatter for two hours. So Keith and I turn up, fully kitted out, gloves, boiler suit, everything, going, come on, where's the logs? Let's do stuff. And they're all a bit kind of, oh, oh, just came for the tea. <laughs> so we're constantly learning this about other people. And, and, and we, we go home and have a debrief. And this, this was my conclusion. I said, you know what? I said, I think we've got this community garden thing. I think we've got it all wrong. It's not about gardening. Because well, we've been there. And like, well, they've been open for five years. And they barely grow a bloody thing. What are they up to? <laughs> Mostly, they're just hanging out, the children come and play, it's a really beautiful space, everybody's having a lovely time. There isn't much physical activity going on, it's not terribly functional. Uh, so we've had to tell ourselves, right, we've only been twice, we mustn't take over, we need to back off, and when everybody else sits down and have tea, we need to have tea as well. And this is how we run our lives, learning bit by bit, out loud, saying, right, this is how we need to behave in this situation so that we don't look more weird than we, than we necessarily need to. This is what autistic life is like, just kind of working it out together, going, hmm, what happened here? Why are we the only people with gloves? Nobody else is really doing any work here. Um, it's, a, it's a minefield out there, very confusing, all of this stuff. You'd think it was about gardening, but it's clearly, clearly not. But it's exhausting. Being autistic is exhausting trying to have relationships. And, and I think in the same way that every single human being has some level of sadness or regret about things that you can't do or you'll never do or whatever, it's just, it's just the way life is. I think it's important that some of us acknowledge that actually sometimes it's sad. Sometimes I see people having times, relationships, interactions that I know I've never had in my life and I'll probably never have. And that's sad. But that's just part of life. And there's lots of other stuff that's really good. But rather than just kind of focusing on that, for me it's just a matter of, well, you know, I'm never going to be an Olympian or a supermodel and, and I'm never going to have some of these experiences. But I think we have to acknowledge that, that we're not setting people up to have, it's not always going to be perfect, it's often not going to be easy, you're often going to have a lot of knockbacks. And you know what, that's all right. Um, and having some kind of perspective about that. Because again, in the black and white world of autism, sometimes there's a feeling like, I have to get this right all of the time. Well, you know what, actually, maybe that's not going to be for you. Maybe in exchange for some of those difficulties socially, maybe you have passions, you have interests, you have skills, you have an ability to be alone, that a lot of people would love. And that, that somewhere in here, we've all got our own package of goods and bads and whatever, and that we all have to kind of learn to, to live with those kind of things, rather than setting people up uh, that they're going to have this, this absolutely amazing, amazing time, which is not always going to work. So, a um, little few sort of ideas about thinking about how we get through the sort of nuts and bolts of this stuff. I've done this with children, with teenagers, might be appropriate certainly for adults and stuff as well, running programmes for, for, for young people. Um, and it's very much about assuming absolutely nothing, going right, right back to the kind of conceptual, the con conceptual kind of level, rather than going, oh, just go out and say hello to somebody and then they will be their friend. It's not going to work like that. So what I have noticed in autistic people um, is that there is a fundamental social error in some autistic people where they struggle enormously to make numerous shallow relationships, shallow in a good way, not in a bad way, uh, in terms of showing interest, investing in people, kind of hanging out with, I don't know, dozens of people that just come across, you know, school, college, work, whatever that might be. And what seems to be my understanding from an outsider's perspective of how most people make friendships is that you, you kind of nurture dozens and dozens of little, like a fishing net. You kind of put it out there and you catch hundreds, tens of, of little fish and one or two of those fish stick in the net and the rest of them disappear. So one or two of those fish become your friends. 
because you've hung out enough, because you've realised that you've got something in common, because there's some investment on both sides. And the rest of them, they just drift away, and that's kind of normal. And that seems to be, to me, roughly how most people make friends. What seems to be the case sometimes for autistic, autistic people is that there just isn't the energy or the skills to continually maintain all of that net full of little fish. And so the person just finds one and targets it. So rather than having a net, they've got a harpoon straight in there. You are going to be my friend. And the reason that person might be chosen is because of their Pokemon collection or they've got nice shoes or they happen to live three doors down the road and that makes them quite convenient. So there might be a particular reason why this person is chosen. Maybe they're just kind. Maybe they're nice in some way. But there isn't necessarily that understanding of reciprocity. So you've got somebody who's just decided that this person's going to be their friend. And if the person doesn't feel the same way, then it's rejection and it's kind of gone. But it's that diving in too deep again, not necessarily understanding that actually we have to tiny, tiny, tiny smile, be friendly to, to a number of people. And one by one, one or two of them might kind of stick around. Unless you're choosing autistic friends, in which case the harpoon might be fine because that person might be delighted to have somebody come and choose them to be a friend. So this is only really relevant if you're trying to have relationships with non-autistic people because that's likely to be more what that person will, will expect. We need to be encouraging, practicing using the muscle of saying, what does this person think about this? How would it be for this person to be on the receiving end of what I'm doing? Do you think they would like that? Quite often, autistic people, if you ask that question directly, the person will go, hmm, that's a good point. No, they wouldn't like it, would they? They can do it, but it isn't necessarily an intuitive thing to do. It might be that someone actually has to explicitly ask you to shift your perspective into someone else's shoes. It may not necessarily be the easiest thing to do naturally, but it's a good question to start asking. Is this an okay thing to do? How would somebody else feel about it? Would they feel the same as me? It might be that the person just says, well, yeah, I would love it, therefore they must love it but some people might be able to make that extra kind of step. But you've got to be asking, got to be putting yourself in someone else's perspective to have, have potential relationships. We've got to use evidence and we've got to use systematic kind of approaches to this thing. It's no good kind of saying, oh, well, that's just the way it is. That doesn't really work for an autistic person. We need to know why this is happening and what we can do to fix it. So, and along with that, we have to understand that friendships end, relationships end, and that you are going to be knocked back. Sometimes people are not going to like you, and that's okay. We have to explicitly teach a lot of this stuff. Not everybody likes you, that's okay. Because you don't like everybody, that's okay. We have to be really, really kind of clearly putting this stuff in perspective. I'd like to ask you a question. It's a bit of a personal question, and you don't have to answer it at all. Who here is in the first and only relationship that they have ever had who's still with the first person that you ever had any kind of relationship with yeah okay we've got three four you're you together are you together okay that's good then <laughs> <laughs> might have been a shock really <laughs> why haven't you got your hand up so we have about 115 people in this room and that was about five people that have been with the first person um if anybody has had two relationships and you're with the second person, your failure rate in relationships is 50%. If anyone's had 10 relationships and you're with the 10th person, your failure rate in relationships is 90%. Is anyone depressed yet? <laughs> the point is, it is relatively typical, and, and our small sample has shown, to have more than one partner in your life, in this culture, in this modern day. That is pretty realistic. So if you have met someone, either as a friend or as a partner, and it didn't work out, in black and white autism world, that can often feel like the absolute devastation of the universe, and life will never be the same again. With perspective, we would say, well, actually, statistically, that's very likely to happen. And it's quite likely that that might happen three or four more times again if you look at the general population. They might not help you at the mo in the moment. You might just go, well, I don't give a toss about that. I'm, I'm having a horrible time. But it gives us some sense of perspective that not every friendship or relationship lasts a lifetime. In fact, the vast majority don't. If you think about the friends that you've got now, 
how many people have got friends from when they were five? You know, maybe one or two, but not a huge amount. You are continuing to leave people behind. You are continuing to bring people along. That's the kind of information we need to be presenting in a completely non-judgmental way to some autistic people. If you don't have many friends, if you don't self-reflect very easily, you don't necessarily understand the big picture, which is, you know what, it's okay. We would expect things. You're not going to choose right the first time, always. And that's okay. It's all just about making it okay. Otherwise, we have devastation. I was going to marry that person. We were going to have children. This is how it was going to be. Well, actually, you only met them a week ago. That's unrealistic. But for some people, it is all or nothing, straight away, very intense. I notice, anybody watch the Undateables? Yeah, I mean, I, there are, I think there are some issues with that program, but actually I think it's quite interesting as well. And something that I notice sometimes is, is this huge intensity that people feel very quickly. I love her. And, and, and these are people that have really haven't known each other for a huge amount of time. So it's, it's very strong and it's very intense because it doesn't come very often. If you're a typical social person who has lots of opportunities to go dating and meet people and make friends, you can afford to be a lot more laissez-faire a lot my blasé about this kind of stuff but if this stuff only happens to you once in a blue moon you will cling on to it for dear life because it's a needle in a haystack and you don't know when it's going to come along again so it's a whole perspective of what your experience of people of life is will depend on on how you relate to this kind of stuff and whether you can cope uh, when it doesn't when it doesn't go well because you don't know when you're going to get a next opportunity whereas for other people the next opportunity might not be too too far away we also need to think about things like, what does it mean to be a friend? How do I know if someone's a friend? How do I know if someone's friendly? How do I know if someone says hello to me on the bus and calls me love, that, that they, they're not flirting with me or they don't want to be my girlfriend? Um, for some autistic people, this gets them into trouble. We, we cannot afford people to have risks like this. We, we have to very clearly and explicitly explain the rules uh, and make sure that this stuff is enormously clear. Asking people why they want friends, really important. What do you expect to get out of this? It gives us huge clues about expectations, about knowledge, about what this person's understanding of people and relationships are. It allows us to start to know if actually this person is going to be all right or if actually they've got some really quite unusual notions of what friendship might be. It's a really important question to, to ask. What are the pros and what are the cons of having a friend? That might seem a little bit mercenary about, you know, what's in it for me? What's the advantages to me? But actually, if something doesn't stack up, what's the point in doing it? And we need to explicitly explain what the point in doing it is. And some of the consequences, the deal of friendship, are these things lifted here you are likely to have to do some kind of maintenance, unless your friend is autistic and is fine about all of that social media, WhatsApp stuff as well. You're going to have to do things you don't want to do. You're going to have to tolerate company when you might prefer to be by yourself. You're going to have to share stuff. You're going to have people around you that don't believe exactly the same things as you believe. And I've done workshops with some young people who, they all wanted a girlfriend. How do I get a girlfriend? I want to get a girlfriend. This is what I want to do, all, all young men. Um, and we talked about all of this stuff. And I said, if you want a girlfriend, you're going to have to clean your teeth every day. You're going to have to have a shower every day. You're going to have to do all of this kind of stuff. You're going to, you know, let's say you've only got 10 quid and she wants to see a film that you don't want to, do, want to watch. And that means you not seeing a film that you want to watch. But, you know, she's your girlfriend, so you're going you're gonna to do what she wants to do? <sighs> It's tough. These are things that sometimes young people don't think about. They haven't occurred to them that there is going to have to be this dilemma. Is it my needs or is it the relationship that is going to come first? Anyone who's ever been in a relationship knows about all of this stuff. It's not always going to be your way. But this has to be taught to some people because they really, really don't, don't get it. The teeth cleaning thing, I'm afraid, doesn't always work because my son, um, he's, he's 22, he's never been able to clean his teeth easily. He cannot bear the sensation of the brush. It's been an absolute battle ever since he was a tiny, tiny baby. Uh, he now lives away from home, so I'm guessing he's in charge of his own teeth and I can't imagine they get cleaned very often. Uh, and I said to him, and he's got a girlfriend, and I, I, said, I said, how have you got a girlfriend? You are so skanky you don't clean your teeth it's just disgusting she's going to leave you and he said no it's fine she doesn't clean her teeth either <laughs> so sometimes this just doesn't work you try to kind of <laughs> 
present the consequences, and he's found a better solution. So, you know, I can't argue with that. Uh, just find a skanky girlfriend, that seems to be the... Uh, and they're very happy together, so that's, that's perfectly fine. But it's having to explicitly explain this stuff. We shouldn't assume anything, because that's when it goes wrong, when somebody says, well, I just wanted to do my thing. I didn't... You know, and I've met couples where people are married, where they've got children, and one of the partners, an, an autistic partner... Is, is coming home from work, doesn't say hello to their partner, doesn't say hello to their children, their need to just disappear off and have a bit of alone time is so extreme, they don't communicate that, but they just disappear. And then they can't really understand why actually people start getting very unhappy with them um, because they haven't appreciated that perhaps this other person had different needs and that there needs to be some communication that says, look, I really love you and I really want to be with you, but when I come through the door, I absolutely need 20 minutes to myself because my brain is fried. Please can I have my 20 minutes and then I will come back and, and be a good person. We've got to have that knowledge and explicit kind of stuff. Otherwise, uh, sadly, things, things often kind of, kind of go wrong. So what do you have to do to have friends? Where do you get them? What do you, what do you need to do? These lads that I asked, um, I said to them, I said, do you think there are any topics that you must not talk about when you, um, when you have friends? Um, and, one of them, and they sat down and they made lists of things that were okay to talk about and things that were not okay. And one of them, his list was of things you shouldn't talk about when you had friends or a relationship was um, fishing, pornography and Perry Como. <laughs> and this was like a 16-year-old boy. It was about five years ago or so. And I thought, wow, OK. I said, tell me what's wrong with Perry Como. And he said, oh, I love Perry Como. And he said, I mustn't start talking about Perry Como because if I start, I'll never stop. So there was a bit of insight in there, and, and the pornography was good. I'm not quite sure the problem with fishing. I think he just loved fishing as well. But he was massively into Perry Como, this kid, um, which was slightly unusual for your peers. You're not going to find many, many peer groups of, of Perry Como fans in 16-year-old boys, I, I, would, I would imagine. Um, so how do you get them? You know, this idea of just like, oh, go and make some friends, just join a club, make some friends. It's just not that easy. We know if you think about how you made your friends, how did you make them? Probably, again, it's through sort of osmosis. It's just we were in the same place for the same time. We had some stuff in common. We had kids. We were working. We were doing a sport. We were there. And over time, you just kind of connect to people. Um, and it, it's trying to get autistic people to feel able to do those sorts of things um, or finding people that are kind of similar, that are, that are willing to override some of those uh, uh, non-autistic kind of, kind of norms. How do you stay safe? How do you read signs of interest? How do you understand how far this relationship is? Do I buy you a birthday card? Do I buy you a birthday present? If I buy you a birthday present, how much money do I spend? How do you know all that stuff? How do you know whether to spend a fiver or 50 quid? It, you just know, and you get it right most of the time. For autistic people, we don't know those rules. It just doesn't, you just don't know. Um, and so the potential for getting it wrong, either by not buying a present at all or buying a massively expensive present, which makes the person go, ooh, that's really weird, is just there all of the time. It's all of this abstract kind of stuff. The rules need to be taught uh, in a very, very definitively ex explicit way. Something that comes up a lot with young people at schools is that they feel that if there's kind of a social group of people, physical people, that if they just stand at the edge, don't really say anything, but just stand at the edge, that somehow you end up getting brought into that group, where the reality is completely the opposite, because you're not contributing you just look weird. And people end up just excluding you from the group because they're like, what is that person doing here? You're laughing at the same jokes, but you never contribute. You never join in. You never offer anything. But it seems that it's very specific about getting the things right. Not talking too much, not talking too little. Saying the right things, but not the wrong things. Making sure that you understand that, that there might be hints, there might be subtle stuff, there might be hidden agendas. And you've got to work all of this stuff out whilst trying to have a conversation all at the same time. There are phenomenal amounts of unspoken rules that autistic people struggle enormously with, not understanding how all of these kind of things fit together. Um, I worked with a young man for six months, and this is something that we developed together. It took us about four or five weeks to do this piece of work. Uh, he was a young man who um, ended up on the sex offenders register because he desperately wanted a girlfriend. Uh, he was in his late teens, um, really nice guy, nice family, very, very, very supportive and lovely family. 
Um, and he really wanted a girlfriend, and he figured, logically, thought about this very carefully, that if he were to sit, around, sit on buses, travel around on buses, um, and if he were to see a girl that he liked, what he would do is when she went to get off at her stop, he would walk up behind her, uh, he would pinch her bottom, uh, he knew she would be cross, and, but when she turned around to tell him off, because she was cross, he would introduce himself, and then she would be his friend, and then maybe they could begin a relationship together. Um, so really quite flawed in lots of ways. Bright guy, he's now at university, um, but, but this, he, you know, horrible experiences of bullying, desperate to be around people, really just teased and horrible, horrible experiences. Um, but, he, but he was very much kind of, this, is, this was his plan. He just wanted to be like everybody else, just wanted a, a, nice, a nice girl to go out with. Unfortunately for him, the girls that he chose were 15, um, and that makes them children. Um, and so he ended up in prison. Um, on remand for a while. Luckily, he had a judge who said, clearly you don't know what you're doing. You're, you're clearly not a danger to anybody. It wasn't sexually motivated. It was just, I don't know how else to get this person to communicate with me at all. Um, and so they allowed him to come and work with me once a week for six months. Um, and this was one of the things that, that, we, that we did together. Um, and, and I got him to plot we talked for weeks and weeks about every single person he could think of that he came across in his life and where we would put them on this, on this series of circles. He walked his dog, he went to the co-op to buy a pint of milk, he had family, there were people at a sports club that he went to, and we plotted them all together and went, actually, where would that person sit there? Are they on a line? Are they very clearly in the middle? Do we not really know? And then we tried to make up a whole set of rules about how you would know if somebody was an acquaintance or a stranger. What would you know about them? Would you know their name? Well, that's tricky because I know the name of the person in the co-op, but I don't know anything else about that person, and they're clearly not a friend or a family member, so that's tricky. Uh, is it about the frequency that you might see somebody? Well, no, not really, because I see the person with their dog every single day, which is far more than I see my grandma, but actually that person is effectively a stranger. So we spent all of this time, and, and I said, what are we doing? What are we doing here? Do you know what we're doing? And he just said, there are no rules, are there? There are no absolute definitive rules. And I said, no, not really. But there are a few. And he said that what he recognized was that what he had tried to do, so physical touch was quite clear, that largely you don't instigate physical touch with people unless they're in those inner circles. That was, that was one thing that seemed to be relatively clear, apart from doctors and standing next to people on trains and that kind of thing. And he said, what I did wrong was I tried to jump too many circles at once. So the first time I met, saw somebody, this girl, I immediately started to behave with her in a way that I would only behave with people in my very cast family. You cannot jump circles quickly. And that was really his learning, was that typically people might move inwards into those circles. Sometimes people immediately become a friend or they stay as strangers, but largely our relationships kind of shift. And the closer they become, the more you know about someone, the more you can do with someone, the, the, more, the more that happens with that person. Um, and that he had tried to behave in, in terms of a family or a friend with a complete stranger. Um, and and that's, that was the kind of real learning for him. You can't jump circles. So that's the kind of stuff. Bright guy, university, to, to stop him, to, to, to get him to kind of understand why it was not okay to try and approach people in that way. It also had never occurred to him that these women might be upset about this. So it was only when, when I said to him, how do you think that might feel? You know, you're quite a big guy, so, so you've, you've got a, a young woman, and all of a sudden, somebody's touched her. She doesn't know who you are. You're standing behind her. Uh, what, what might that feel like? And he said, oh, that would be awful. That would be really frightening. But he wasn't able to make that leap by himself. It had to be something that, that, he, was, that he was kind of helped to do. Um, so don't be afraid of all this stuff. It's, it's really just a matter of, you know, you just make it up as you go along. There's so few tools and stuff out there for this kind of thing that, that um, all of us working in this area, we, we just have to kind of think, well, actually, how am I going to get this message across to somebody? How, how do I do this? <coughs> in terms of adult relationships, intimate relationships, most people, I think, would like one on some form or another, in some terms or another. 
Um, and it's very much kind of in the context of that individual's preferences and their needs. How much space do I need? How much time do I need? How far can I travel? Can I only be in a relationship with somebody who lives quite near me? Do I have particular sensory preferences? Do I want an intimate relationship or is that something that I absolutely, definitely, definitely don't want? What about interests? How big a part of my life? Do I want somebody who's going to share those interests or am I quite happy to do those by, by themselves? How much capacity do I have to actually share my time with this person? Can I have children? Do I want children? Is that something that's important to me? So there's a whole load of factors, which obviously everybody has to work out. Some of them are kind of slightly more autistically focused. It's not just a matter of, hey, we like each other, let's just you know, move in together and, and, and get married. And so for some people, vast majority of people that I'm aware of are in very typical monogamous relationships. Some people are not. Some people have conven unconventional solutions uh, for all of those factors which are important of them. Uh, they may live apart. They may have multiple partners, polyamorous, poly polygamous uh, relationships. They may have partners who live in different countries. They may have partners who have very different language, first languages and different cultures. If you're in a relationship with somebody who doesn't speak the same language as you or has a very different culture than you, there are a lot of concessions that you make for each other because nothing is assumed. If you're going out with an English-speaking person within the same culture, there's a lot of assumption that you will just get this stuff. Take away all of that and suddenly you're explaining things. Suddenly you're saying, oh, well, maybe you didn't get that because you're French or whatever. There are people seem to be much kinder and much more willing to explain the nuances with a partner of a, of a different, different language. Some people have absolutely non-physical non relationships. Some people only have physical relationships. The fetish community online is full of autistic people having lovely sensory times with each other. You don't have to flirt, you don't have to worry about consent, you just find someone online, you share the same thing, you meet up, you do your thing with bubble wrap and cotton buds, and then off you go again and everybody's happy. You don't have to worry about all that tedious, uh, you know, complicated kind of do they, don't they kind of stuff. Functional relationships where everybody gets their needs met, as long as it's safe and consensual, uh, not really any, any issues with any of those kind of things. For some people, their relationships are only online, that they don't ever meet the people that they, they are in a relationship with. Uh, also, some people, I certainly know uh, one person particularly who's the only way, his, his life is so full of routine and schedule and everything having to be absolutely precise. He knows that there's no way that he could ever find a partner who would be able to fit within these tiny, tiny gaps of time that he has. Uh, and so he pays for companionship as well as, uh, as, as, well as um, physical uh, relationships with a, with a paid escort. Um, the main thing he's cross about is that he has to pay, but he does appreciate that, that actually it's just not possible for him to be flexible enough to just have someone go, hey, I'm free, do you want to hang out? <gasps> absolutely not. His life is absolutely run very, very, in a very structured and, and careful way. We know that some people are very vulnerable and attract predatory types um, because you can't spot the hidden agendas. You don't know that, that somebody's, you know, got something else kind of going on and so a lot of people a lot of autistic people particularly autistic women um, have been in abusive and difficult relationships and encounters uh, which they haven't seen coming uh, at all uh, I did a little Twitter survey a little while ago uh, and asked autistic people about what love felt like to them uh, and these were their responses wanting to spend time with someone every day without gouging my own eyes out Maybe everyone feels like that about their partner, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I've never met anyone who irritates me less than he does. <laughs> We're a deeply romantic bunch, the autistic community. <laughs> more obsessed and st stalky at first, then more disinterested over time. Being in a bubble with a one person who feels like an extension of yourself takes no effort to be with them while it takes so much effort to be with anyone else in the planet. So that kind of goes back to this idea of certain people for certain periods of time doing certain activities um, are beautiful and wonderful and joyful, whereas just random hanging out with people is often stressful and overwhelming and more hassle than it is pleasurable. Um, and typically, as I said before, it's often about someone similar 
that, that really kind of gets you, that, that just lets you be yourself, lets you do your weird stuff and gives you the, the kind of space. Certainly for me and, and in my relationship, I know that most people find Keith and I quite difficult to be around, but we find each other really easy to be around. Whereas we find everybody else quite difficult to be around, and you all find each other quite easy to be around. So we kind of need to stick to ourselves because nobody else will put up with us. And that's good, because <laughs> we don't like you either. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of support around both friendships and relationships, it's got to be autism specific. I hope that you've kind of picked up that there's something very fundamental for some people that is just not understood on a conceptual level. Um, it's not necessarily intuitive to just know how often to ring someone, to know whether it's okay to do something. Some of that stuff has got to be taught absolutely assuming nothing, absolutely starting completely and utterly from scratch. It may be that what suits these people is not what suits you. That may feel a bit weird, you may feel sorry for them, you may just think that's just really odd. If it's safe, if it's consensual, if it's working, if it's making somebody happy, who are we to judge if that's something that's good for somebody else? If we know that autistic people perceive the world differently, why wouldn't they perceive their relationship experiences differently? Um, it's not going to be the same as it is for everybody else, and we've got to kind of chuck all of that idea kind of out, really. We need to teach sexual health education, again, on a really, really basic level um, about body parts, about periods, about touching, about all sorts of things. Really, really basic. Um, in a very kind of social context. Social media is a bit of a nightmare for a lot of young people with you know, mobile phones and taking photographs of your bits and sending them around because that's what someone told you to do. There's a huge amount of vulnerability. How many friends you've got on Facebook? Is it really a friend? Well, no, I don't even know half these people. Um, again, a huge amount of vulnerability. You take that literally. They said, they're my friend. Oh, it, you know, it's scary stuff for some of these young people, particularly if they're really keen to get involved in friendships and relationships and those kind of things. Everything has to be really, really kind of laid out in a very basic, basic kind of a way. Uh, the future, what we learn from autistic adults, what we learn from late, late diagnosed autistic adults, people who've had no support, no diagnosis, no knowledge whatsoever, and you look at what their lives look like, what we tend to see is that autistic adults have quite small social networks. That's good. That's fine. Most people don't want a lot of friends. They don't want to go out that often. They don't want to have loads and loads of people in their lives because that would require a lot of ongoing maintenance, uh, and that's quite hard work. Often one-to-one -one interactions, a little bit less frequent than other people, often activity-based, interest-based, often with similar friends and partners, struggling sometimes with a lot of the superficial chit-chat, and, and often really loving spending some time alone, not entire solitude. Autistic children are going to grow into these adults, and, and I think this is what we can learn from older people, is that if you... We're the feral autistic generation that nobody helped, nobody put in any support. And actually, most of us are all right. Um, we're a bit battered mentally along the way. Um, but actually, most people have found jobs, lives, relationships, friends, and things that actually suit them relatively well. Um, and it's working with the person that you've got. This person's never going to be not autistic. So it's, it's working with it rather than, than working against it. Um, unconventional people seek unconventional solutions and we should help them find those unconventional solutions, that's, that's really important I think.